my notes. Okay, great. Hello, welcome everyone. Um, we're so glad that you are here and um, wanna just welcome you to our session today. Um, thank you for joining. My name is Sarah McAllister and I am the Associate Director here for Alumni Career and Professional Development. Nicole Bush, our director, is also joining us today, and she will be on tech support. Um, so if you have any questions or issues, please feel free to direct message her on here. Um, we are both so glad that you have joined us. We are so excited to have the Honorable Robin DeRusso as our guest speaker today. Um, before we start our conversation, I want to review just a few housekeeping items for you all. Um, as I mentioned, please use the chat um, for any issues to Nicole, but also if you have questions, please put those in the chat um, and there'll be plenty of time at the end to um, have discussion and answer your questions. And then also the session is being recorded. Um, and is gonna be uploaded to our YouTube channel this afternoon. Um, so Nicole is gonna drop that link in the chat. So that's gonna have this recording and also it has all of our previous recordings for a professional development series. Um, so please feel free to check that out um, for, for past recordings and future recordings as well. Um, okay, so my favorite part. Um, I wanna thank Judge Jeruso for taking the time to be with us today. Um, the goal of our conversation is to learn more about your professional journey and provide some takeaways for everyone um, interested in pursuing roles in public service or just learning more about you. Um, so to get us started today, Judge Jeruso, can you introduce yourself? What is your current role and anything else that you think would be helpful to share about yourself? Sure. I'm, um, and welcome, everybody. I'm delighted to see y'all. I'm Robin Jeruso. Um, I have served as a judge of civil district court in New Orleans. I've done that for more than 33 years. It's an elected position. Um, our court is interesting and different in, in two ways. New Orleans is the only city that divides its court system into criminal and civil courts. And I sit on the civil court, so I don't have any criminal jurisdiction at all. Um, which is, some, is obviously, as I said, is unusual. The other thing that our court does that is different is the junior judges of our court handle the family court or the domestic relations court. So I did that for the first three years that I sat on the bench. And since then, I have handled the, um, the regular civil docket. I'm a native of Denver, Colorado, and like many people came to New Orleans to go to, I call it Newcomb College, but we'll say Tulane, um, and fell, of course fell in love with New Orleans, stayed for law school, fell in love with my husband who was a New Orleanian and said they don't have crawfish in the Rocky Mountains and we're going to live here, and so I've lived here the rest of, um, you know, since law school. Um, I served for 10 years uh, in the city attorney's office when I first got out of law school. And then my position is one that's elected. So I ran for office. Um, initially I had opposition and up until last year, I got reelected without opposition. And last year, which will be my last term, I did have opposition again, but um, was successful in retaining my seat. I love that. Um... Thinking about, so we're gonna, let's kind of like rewind a bit to that to that early part of your career. Um, how did you just make your per early professional decisions? Why law school? Why becoming a judge? Um, and what questions did you ask yourself in, in those early days? Sure, well, when I started at Newcomb, my plan was to become a clinical psychologist. Um, I was very interested in doing things that helped people. And I'm not sure that I really thought about law school, although I think in some ways was in the back of my mind. And a um, couple of things propelled me to change my mind about that. The first was I got a C in statistics, which I knew would be hard to get, which was the only C I ever got at Newcomb. Um, but I knew that it would be difficult to get into grad school with that. At the same time I got that, I took because of the Newcomb requirements of having um, classes in different disciplines, I took an introduction to political science class from Dr. Jean Danielson, who for those of you that are a little bit older that are on the call probably remember, they called her Dean Jean, but at the time I had her, she was, um, I believe the chair, or at least a, a, a revered member of the political science department. 
And I fell in love with political science, um, the whole study of it. She became my advisor. And at that point really encouraged me to go on to law school. Um, while I was in law school, I got married and much to my surprise, about 15 months after I got married, my son was born and I, which was sort of not in the plans, but he turned out okay, so that's all right. Um, so that when I got out of school and I was planning my professional career as an attorney, I knew I wanted to continue to work when I got out of law school. But I'd looked around and looked at the firms and realized that it would be very hard to balance being a mom and going to work in a law firm. The, my friends who were older and were working in law firms were working really long hours. They were um, required to work nights and weekends. And um, I just didn't want to do that. It didn't seem in the plans. And then I looked around, I realized that government seemed to be a good place for someone who wanted to have, I wanted both things. I wanted to, to, to be a really good mom and I wanted to have a career. So I was lucky enough to get a job when um, Dutch Moriel came in as the mayor in his city attorney's office. Um, interestingly, my plan was, which also did not work out very well, that I was, I was like, I'll just do research. I'm happy to be in the library because I knew that would give me regular and write briefs. And I knew that would give me regular hours. And they ended up giving me a docket that had the most litigation of anybody in, uh, in the entire office. And again, something else that came to my great surprise, I found out I loved litigating. It was kind of like theater and I liked being in the courtroom and I liked the challenges of being in the courtroom. And that really was what propelled me into, the, into being a judge is I watched judges do their work. It looked like something I would be good at, something I would like to do. And I also noticed that the bench was becoming younger and younger. Um, at least at the time I got elected, I think people thought of judges as being old white men. Um, and that was starting to change. And I, at the time I ran, the first time I know the people that helped me do my public relations were very concerned about that because the perception at that time was that um, a young woman was not someone that we think of as being a judge. So we had to figure out how to counteract that when I ran for office. Um, it has turned out to be a career that I have loved. I, I, um, it's, re, it's the reason I made the decision to run again one more time. In Louisiana, judges have to retire. Um, they can't, well, let me say this. If you're on the bench and you turn 70, you can stay until your term is over. Um, but you can't run again. And that will happen to me during this term. So I will not be able to run again. I debated a lot about whether I was gonna run for my last term, but I just really like what I do so much. And I find it still very rewarding and very challenging. And it's the reason I decided to uh, go one more time. I, I wish that we, I, my hope is for all of us to have that. that That's I, 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 yeah, I mean, I, in the morning when I get up, I like to go to work, so. Yeah. Um, in retrospect, though, I wanted to mention something, Sarah. As I look back, I think there were some things that maybe were in the back of my mind um, that I didn't realize until I actually became elected a judge that influenced me. Um, one of them was we belonged, as, when I was a kid growing up in Denver, to a community center. And there was, a, a I believe she's still a federal court judge. Um, her name was Zita Weinshank, and people used to point her out, that's a woman and she's a judge. And the other thing for people of my generation, the assassination of President Kennedy was um, maybe the most important historical event that we probably remember. It was horrific, um, and, but the one, one of the things that I remember about it was Lyndon Johnson was sworn in as the new president by a woman judge. Her name was Sarah Hughes. Um, and again, I saw this woman in a role that I really didn't know women could have. Um, and I think I was influenced by that too. I think that, you know, that's so powerful. And, and one of the conversations that you and I had yesterday was about gen how does gender play? I know you've talked a little bit about that so far, but I'd love to you just to expand a little bit more if, if of what comes to mind in terms of um, you know, it feels like gender played a role in how, what motivated you to become a judge. Um, it played a role in that first, your first election. How has it, 
how has it just affected your own professional experience? Sure. Well, I think it's changed a lot over the years. Um, when I practiced in the city attorney's office, the last five years that I was there, I took over for a, an attorney who had retired doing um, contract and construction litigation, which at that time was a very, very male dominated um, a, a part of the profession. Um, many times when I would go to a deposition or, or, or to court to litigate, I was the only woman in the room. And initially, I think the men felt like they could take advantage of me um, until they found out they couldn't. But it was kind of fun to let them try to do that. Um, and when I got elected, I was the th third woman on the bench. Um, there were now my court is more women than it is men. Um, I think there are only three or four male judges of the 14 of us, um, which is and, and people don't seem surprised to find a judge, a woman sitting in that position, nor are they surprised that they're women lawyers practicing um, in front of me. But Many times early on in my career, if I was sitting in the front office where people come for papers and someone would be, can you get the judge to sign this? And I'm like, okay, and I would sign it. And then, no, no, the judge has to sign it. I'd have to go, well, I'm the judge. Um, also, sometimes I think people have expectations that you may not know things. Um, in a, I remember in a, um, a court argument that had to do with a mathematical calculation, a lawyer tried to explain to me what the numerator and denominator of a fraction was. Um, and of course, I always try to handle things like that with a sense of humor and not like I know what that is. I'm like, yeah, I was helping my third grader with homework last night. I do know what a numerator and denominator are, but thank you for pointing that out to me. Um, so I think expectations have re and really, really changed. I, I think I had mentioned to you yesterday, Sarah, when we were talking about this, um, in, in my first job interview, and actually it was a job interview for the city attorney's office, the um, attorney who interviewed me asked me what I was going to do with my, um, with my son if I got the job. Um, and of course, the sarcastic part of me was, well, I'm just gonna leave him at home to fend on himself. I mean, he's two, he can manage on his own. Um, but, um, the, the part of me that really wanted the job and the, and the better answer was to say, well, I wouldn't have applied for this job had I not made re, um, recommendations, uh, uh, made accommodations and, and something for him to do. And I knew they weren't asking any of the male candidates who had young children what they were doing with their, their daughters or their sons. Um, but I also did not want to be, be rude and I wanted the job. So it was, it was um, I, I figured that was the better answer. And of course it worked. But I even got asked while I was campaigning initially, well, what are you going to do with your children? Well, I'm going to let them go to school. And they're going to go to aftercare, just like every working mom's kids do. We can manage to do both things. It's um, obviously that's something because my, my son is much older um, that I don't get asked anymore. But um, and I my younger women colleagues tell me that they have not been confronted that issue. But I certainly did. Oh, that's good to hear that it's changing a bit. I think um, it has. That's great. When kind of thinking back to, you know, all the different experiences that you've shared so far, um, what advice, if any, would you give your younger self starting out? I think the most important advice I would give my younger self is to take better care of myself. Um, I think I wanted to be so much the best judge I could possibly be and the best mom I could possibly be and the best wife I could possibly be and whatever role I had, but I often ignored myself. I, you know, I didn't give myself time to maybe exercise or go um, have fun with friends or um, anything like that. So I would, and, and look again, looking at my younger colleagues, I think they do a much better job of that than, um, my than I did, and that some of the colleagues who were of my generation did. Um, I think it's really, really important to um, to to do that. And I, I did not. I will say I know I did not do a good job of that. Mm -hmm. And that leads into right this conversation. Or we're, we're already there about um, work life balance, right? I know that you talked about that and how you made those decisions early on. How how do you define work life balance now? 
And what, I guess another question is how do you um, manage your own staff around there? How does that come up and how you are a, man a leader? Um, well, it's a lot easier now that, you know, my kid, my son has grown and I don't really have um, the kind of obligations that you have as a young mother when, you know, until your children actually leave the nest. Um, it's, it's a lot easier. And I do find that I have said, you know, I'm going to come in a little later this morning because all my cases have settled because I'm going to go take a long walk or, or um, you know, I'm going to leave a little bit earlier today. We're going to stop at four o'clock today because I want to go to the 4.30 or five o'clock exercise class. I can tell you early on in my career, I would never have done anything like that. I just wouldn't have. And it, it, was, it was wrong on my part. Um, but, it's, you know, hindsight, hindsight is 2020. So it's very easy to look back and do that. Um, with my staff, I have tried really hard to have expectations that they do a really good job, but if they have family uh, things that they need to attend to, they're, um, I, I give them the opportunity to do that. So for example, and you asked this earlier, Sarah, about how busy we are at the port um, this time of year, especially the week of Christmas and the week of New Year's, we're not busy at all. So I let my staff do what we call a skeleton crew where they pick the date, somebody has to be there, but not all four of them have to be there at the same time. So I let them stagger working. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I just think it's important to be able to do that so they can have time with their families. Um, I've also like asked them to look at what the docket looks like so that they're definitely there if we're in the middle of a jury trial, but if they need to go to the doctor or have some other family obligation, if they could do it during the times that we're less busy. And we, you know, we just try to work like that because I want everybody to feel comfortable and happy. And um, if they do that, it makes for a much easier workplace. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that. I just wanted to, I don't know if um, you're looking at the chat, but um, you got a great compliment from Lynn. Insane. Well, I did. And actually, I, I of course know Lynn for many, many years. Lynn Luker is one of the people on that. Um, but it, it really, in the kind of the form of, it may be a question, because I do want to talk about that, and it's mm -hmm. mentoring and being a role model, because I think it's really, really important, and I've tried really hard to do that, even if it's not in a formal way, but an informal way. Um, for those people on this that are attorneys, they know that many times the partner is accompanied by the associate to court and the partner, the associate may have done all the work, but the partner is the one that's going to get up and argue. Um, and I, when I started noticing that phenomenon a lot, often the partner was a man who hadn't done any of the work and the associate was the woman who had done all of the work and probably knew the case better. And if I could tell they were ready, I often would say, well, instead of you arguing this, why don't you let Ms. Luca argue this? I kind of like to hear what she has to say. Um, and um, I have tried, if I see women lawyers come in to try to take them under my wing and encourage them to do things in the legal community. And, and, and um, I've worked really hard at that. And I appreciate the compliment from Lynn, because I think it's, I don't think we realize sometimes that we are role models to people and certainly, Sarah Hughes, who I talked about earlier, who had sworn in Lyndon Johnson, had no idea I was alive, except to me, she was a role model when I saw her be able to be the person that could, um, that would, that would, that swore Lyndon Johnson in and could be a, a, a woman and a judge. Um, and that was important. So. Mm -hmm. Well, on that same line of kind of mentoring and, and, and guidance, um, I'm, I'm bummed that Millie Beth had to jump off because she had a great question about you know, what advice would you give to women who may be interested in being in an elected position, but who are afraid of the process? And it, it is a very scary process, so they're right to be afraid of it. Um, I will tell you what we did in my, um, when I ran the first time, and I think it was really important. Um, I, I knew that I wanted to be a judge, so I knew I had to go through the process. Um, I was very lucky because I had no idea when I took the job in the city attorney's office that I would make all the political contacts that I could make, but I did. And that was very helpful to me. So I think it's really important to know what are your strengths 
and what are your weaknesses? And even weaknesses may not be your weakness, but something that someone may think of you as having as a weakness. Um, so you, you need to analyze those and decide how you're going to respond to them. I mean, I was very lucky that one of my strengths was the fact that I had a lot of political connections. I did know, however, that I was gonna be criticized because of my last name. My father-in-law at that time had been a police chief in New Orleans from and a very popular police chief from 1960 to 1970. And then he was a, um, a city councilman. So I was criticized a lot for, well, you're just trading in on your last name. You don't have the credentials to run. So I needed to know and have a way to respond to that. The other thing, which was really sad, and I'm, I, we, we have not seen this in some time, but the judge who I replaced ran for the Court of Appeal, um, and he um, is Jewish, and his opponent in that race put out a, a um, political mailer saying, vote for the only Christian in the race, which of course was a very anti-Semitic piece. I'm Jewish and I was pretty sure that the same thing was gonna to happen to me and we needed to figure out how to respond to it. And of course it did. Um, so what um, we spoke with the Anti-Defamation League and they came up with some very good advice and we took the anti-Semitic mailer that had been circulated um, in the community and mailed it to the entire Jewish community of New Orleans, which of course was very helpful to my election. So you need to know Again, I guess my advice is to figure out your strengths and weaknesses and then figure out how you're gonna to respond to them. Now, some of these were not my ideas. As I mentioned, the Anti-Defamation League, you've got to hire a really good team. And I also see a, a question in the chat about how my election was different this time than it was the first time. And boy, was it different. Um, it's a good question. Um, the first time, I think I had to spend a lot more time selling myself because I, you know, people didn't know who I was. I was not an incumbent and I was not a long-term incumbent. Um, when I ran last year, I had been on the bench more than 30 years. So most of the people in the legal community knew who I was. They knew my reputation. They knew what kind of job I did. Um, that was not true in the, in the first one. And of course I got a lot of criticism Another thing that I got criticism about was that I'd worked in the city attorney's office and not in a law firm. Um, but I had litigated more than maybe many lawyers and law firms had done. So that was a way to respond to that. This time was very different because of, the so of social media. I mean, there was no social media when I ran in 1988. And we had to hire a social media consultant, um, which was something I had no idea that we were going to have to do. So besides the person who produces your radio and TV commercials and the person who does your mailing uh, and the person who does your polling. And yes, it's very expensive to run for public office. Um, we had to hire someone to manage the social media to um, be on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. And um, she did an excellent, excellent job. And another thing in that instance was very important to me because she was the first time that it ever had a woman consultant because most of the political consultants in New Orleans are men. Um, there are a few women, but it was very important to me to at least have one woman working um, for me during the election and she did an excellent job. Um, thinking about, you know, both, I wanna pivot to kind of your day-to-day. -day. Sure. The day to day life right now. Um, we talked a little bit before we started today about. I know you mentioned, you know, kind of your cycles of of being a, being in the courtroom. Um, you talked a little bit about what it, I, I, the question is like. What is what excites you about your job, and then what is a day to day? What does it look like for you? Well, as I mentioned earlier, um, I I just love my job because, and I think the main reason is because I learn something new almost every day. Um, the cases that I like to try the most are medical malpractice cases. Now, I, I know there aren't any doctors or nurses or hospital administrators in the audience. They probably would not want to hear me say that. Um, but it's, it's just the medical trials are very interesting because you learn about different medical conditions 
and what it is that the doctor should or shouldn't have done or the nurse shouldn't have shouldn't have done. And I find that very interesting. But anytime I'm in a trial, there usually is someone who's going to testify about an area that I don't know about, whether it's an architect or a doctor or an engineer. Um, uh, it's just interesting to me and it's ongoing way of learning more and more about what you're supposed to be doing um, in, in your profession or your practice. Um, day to day is, is kind of interesting because my schedule is never ever the same. I think I had mentioned to you earlier in our court, we don't have enough physical room for every judge to have jurors um, every month. So we alternate judge and jury months. So January will be one of my jury months. My jury months are usually much busier and harder to manage than my judge trial months. Um, because if you, we will schedule mostly on Mondays, somewhere between four and six jury trials. Most that, many of my cases settle, but those that don't, you obviously have to take to trial and managing a jury trial is very difficult um, because you're not just managing the lawyers, you're managing all the jurors and they, don't as many times as you can give them instructions about what they're supposed to do or not do. Sometimes they're not so good about following it. You have to watch to make sure they're not a, you know, going to sleep or not paying attention to what's going on. Certainly you wouldn't want me to go to sleep or not pay attention when you were testifying or arguing in my court. Um, I find those, even when I was much younger, when I would come home at the end of the day from a jury trial, I'm exhausted because even though I'm not the one having to make the decision about what happens um, in the case, because we, and we tell that to the jury over and over again, as the judge, I'm not making the decision, you are. That's the reason you have to pay such close attention to what's going on. That it is still very tiring to, to manage all those people. You're kind of like an orchestra conductor. Um, almost every other, we usually work on juries between nine and five, I find by five o'clock that the jurors are getting tired. They want to go home and be with their families. And I try to make them the promise, I'll let you go home by five if you promise me that you'll come on time and that you'll pay attention and um, listen to all the other orders of the court. Almost, well, we, I alternate now because my docket is such that I can do it. On Fridays, we have our motion dockets. Uh, where people come and they're mostly argument and not they're on over legal issues as opposed to actually trying cases. Um, and also that can be very challenging and interesting because you might have, usually I have somewhere between 45 and 50 uh, of those cases on the docket. Um, my law clerk prepares for me a bench memo of the comparing the two arguments and then they'll say what they think should happen. Um, I try to get those at least a couple days in advance. I usually bring them home and read them at night and then make notes. Um, I wanna read what this case says because I'm not sure this is correct or um, I want my law clerk to do some additional research or I need to do some additional research. I try really hard on those Fridays to rule from the bench. And so I, you need to be really prepared and know what the arguments are and what the case law is. I have a, law, a new law clerk. I had um, someone with me for about 17 years and she decided to move on. Um, and I have a, a newer law clerk with me now. And he, he's like, how do you know how to rule on these things? I'm like, well, some of what comes up repeats itself um, or at least the issues repeat themselves. And some of them are brand new and very challenging. Uh, on the judge months, which I will, I'm in a judge month now. And again, I'll be in a judge month in February. Um, it's uh, not quite as challenging. We still do work from nine to five. I'm um, usually call the lawyers in and we, and I do this in a jury trial too. We talk about the case um, and we try to get the cases to settle. About 80% of our dockets settle um, before they go to trial. And one of, for me, what I have found the most important thing uh, in getting a case to settle to settle is that lawyers know your docket is current. So the, the more current your docket is, the more likely you are to go to trial, which means the more likely you are to know your case, which means the more likely you are to settle. Um, and that's one of the things that's kind of interesting um, and will be challenging um, 
in part because of COVID and part because of other some legal um, changes in the law. We didn't try jury trials for a year because of COVID, because we could do, and I'll, I'll mention, we did a lot of things by Zoom. You can, the motion docket that I talked about on Fridays, we did that all by Zoom for probably at least six months. Um, some of the judges are still doing it that way. I, I don't like it and I'm much, uh, I much prefer to have lawyers in my courtroom. So if you come with your mask, I'm pretty happy to have you in the courtroom. Uh, but you, I don't know how you would do a jury trial by Zoom. It would be very challenging. Um, I have a hard time with sometimes with jurors paying attention or not going to sleep, as I've mentioned, when I'm sitting there eyeballing them. So you can imagine what it would be like if they were on Zoom. Uh, I just don't see I do that. And it's a concern to me because my docket is not as current as it was. Um, it makes it a, um, a problem uh, for me, but that's kind of what our schedule is like. I usually take some time off in the summer. I've found very early on that lawyers don't want to work over holidays. Um, and even if the lawyers want to work over holidays, their witnesses definitely don't want to work over holidays. If that's an expert witness, they definitely don't want to work over holidays. Um, so usually you know, we take some time off over the Christmas holidays, the week of Mardi Gras, so, you know, we're not as busy during those times. Um, I do notice in the chat that um, Lynn Luker has also pointed out, and I do try to do this on the motion docket. Um, before I start out, I usually try to let people know the updates in the law. For example, there are a couple of updates um, that are coming up that'll be effective January 1st, one of which is lawyers are gonna be required to put their email addresses on their pleadings, which is, um, pretty new and apparently you're going to be able to serve lawyers through email, which I think is going to be very problematic, but nobody asked me, um, so, <laughs> which happens a lot. And, you know, there, our New Orleans Bar Association does a really wonderful update CLE that they usually have three or four of our state legislators who are lawyers come talk about the changes in the law from year to year. And I try to attend that continuing legal education seminar every year because I think it's critical. Um, and often I'll ask, well, what motivated you to do this? Or did you think about this? And they're like, that's a good question. We'll have to fix that next year or so. Because you know, um, unfortunately, sometimes people don't think of all the ramifications. And I don't know all the ramifications. I'm just saying that often they'll, they'll we'll put something into effect that they haven't figured out. And it takes some time to, to work it out. Mm -hmm. You talked about, I mean, you just, you just mentioned so much, so many great pieces of your day-to-day -day life. And I actually want to pivot to, um, your volunteer experience because I, I'm personally in such awe of the amount of time that you put into your work and you have such a impressive resume in terms of volunteer experience, how I'd love for you to just talk about it and, and what motivates you to continue to volunteer. Sure. Well, I think it's the same thing as why I love doing it. Uh, it's as simple as that. Um, as you know, I have I have sat on and I'm now the chair of the Career Services Committee for or co-chair um, of the Tulane Alumni Association. Well, I love Tulane. That's pretty easy. It's pretty, and you know I credit my Newcomb education as well as my law school education for getting me to where I am today. There's no question about it. Um, I was lucky enough to go junior year abroad um, to France, and um, that was an incredible experience. And I think probably gave me a taste for wanting to be very active in my community, as well as learning about other people's communities. Uh, I've done a variety of different things. Um, you know, I, I lost a child as an adult who was disabled, so I was very active in the disability community but I felt like it was important for me to give back to her. Um, and of course, part of it was, the main reason is it's really a lot of fun to make connections with people from all over. I've met so many interesting people in doing that. And I really do think as a professional, you have an obligation to be involved in the community, whether it's in your neighborhood association, in your church or synagogue, um, you know, in your university community, uh, for me, I also do some things in the legal community, which I also think are important. I um, am very interested in ethical behavior and in professionalism. So I was 
actually appointed by the Supreme Court to our state's Judiciary Commission, which is the um, commission that makes recommendations about judges who've been accused about unethical behavior to the Supreme Court. And I served as the chair of the commission for a year because I think it's important our community needs ethical judges and there's no question about it. I've also served as the chair uh, and I continue to do that of our New Orleans Bar Association um, Professionalism Committee, which gives an award every year to an attorney for professional behavior. And that's another thing that's very important to me because it's you can be ethical and not be professional and um, we are now obligated to take not only an ethics um, continuing legal education hour every year, um, but we're also obligated to take a professionalism one. And that's, professionalism is a lot harder to teach than ethics. Ethics, you can say, this is the rule, don't violate it. Professionalism is way more an attitude and um, how you treat people and being kind and um, it, it's, and they sometimes talk about Rambo ethics or Rambo, te uh, not ethics, Rambo techniques. Um, and we do see that with lawyers. And I think it's incumbent upon me as a judge to tell an attorney, we don't do that in my courtroom. Um, I think another thing sometimes that lawyers forget, and I tell this to young lawyers all the time, I know that when lawyers go to lunch with one another, they talk about judges, because that's what I did when I was a lawyer. Um, well, guess what judges talk about? They talk about lawyers. <laughs> um, and when we go to lunch together or have our, you know, and we do once a month have a, a business meeting of the court. Um, and we, we will talk about lawyers, both good and bad. We can say something like, you know, Lynn Luker was in my court today and she gave a really good closing argument or, you know, um, lawyer so-and-so was, was in my court today and they handled a difficult lawyer so well. But on the other hand, we're also going to say, do you know lawyer so-and-so? Because God, he was so rude to the witness and he was disrespectful to people. Um, and when I hear that, and it's a lawyer I don't know, if they appear in my court, well, I'm not gonna treat them any differently. It is in the back of my mind. So that's important for, for lawyers to remember. Oh, that's, that's crucial. Um... I want to uh, give everyone just a chance. I know we're we're kind of getting to the end of our questions and wrapping up. So I wanted to make sure that everyone had an opportunity to ask their questions. Um, so I'm going to ask you one more question and then see if there's. Sure, and I, I, I thought of one other thing um, too, because I think you asked me um, when we talked yesterday, what surprised you the most about your job um, mm -hmm. that you didn't know going in? And I think one of the, the, the main thing that surprised me the most is how much administrative work judges have to do. Um, I think I had a really good sense when I got on the bench about managing a docket and um, how difficult it might be when both sides of the argument are compelling. Um, and I, I think I had an idea how difficult it might be to rule against somebody who I perceived as being a friend but I had no idea how much work I would be doing outside of sitting in the courtroom um, as a judge because there are personnel issues and budgetary issues and those take up a lot of time. Um, and some of them were things, uh, you know, budgeting is not my area of expertise. Um, so that was very, fortunately we have judges on our court who know a lot more about that than I do. And uh, we rely upon them for that. That's, that's Sarah, you were going to ask me a question. Well, let's go to Rob real quick and then I'll, I'll mine's more of kind of a, a wrap up. Um, uh, did you hold trial by judge during COVID? And I think you talked about, so can you just branch out on how did sure. that change during COVID? Sure. Um, well, it, you know, initially we, the court shut down on March 16th. Um, I remember the day because it's my granddaughter's birthday. Um, <laughs> But I, oh, another thing about our schedule, which I didn't mention, um, there are 14 of us on the court. So we alternate every 14 weeks of being duty judge. And the duty judge is obligated to be there from nine to four every day that they're duty, Monday through Friday, and on call nights and weekends um, to sign orders and contend with emergencies. So that if like, if I wanna give the speech today, I can take time away because I know there's a duty judge who is, is handling those matters. So we actually were at court even though everybody else left. Um, 
And it, that was a little bit challenging because at that point we knew so little about COVID on March 16th and um, you know, people were wearing rubber gloves and, um, and we were concerned, can this be like if I touch a paper that somebody else had COVID can, well, and actually had two staff members who came to me later that afternoon and told me they didn't feel comfortable coming to work the rest of the week. So it was very challenging to work with only two staff members, but we managed. Um, and then for probably maybe two months, there was a lot of emailing going on, but we really weren't hearing too many things by Zoom because I don't know about anybody else. I had no idea what Zoom was um, nope. and neither did any of the lawyers. Um, and then we realized, wait, we can conduct hearings by Zoom. So we did conduct status conferences where we would talk to lawyers about their cases to see if we can get them to settle or whatever, or just kind of figure out some calendaring issues. Um, and then we realized that we could probably do the motion dockets by Zoom. And we started doing those. It was very challenging because normally we have between 40 and 50 matters set on the docket. Um, and everybody comes at nine o'clock and we just work through them as who's ever there and ready we take. And many times I can be finished by 10, 30 or 11, but we didn't think it would work well um, to do that with Zoom. So we staggered the Zoom hearings every 15 minutes, which meant that I was opening and closing Zoom hearings, but we were able to manage a lot of cases and we're able to move our motion docket fairly well. And one of the things that I found challenging was the lawyers who are even less technically savvy than I am, um, who just couldn't figure out how to get on Zoom. And, and we would, I, I remember hearing one of my staff members go, well, you just, you had to have gotten the email because you know when it is, well, click the hyperlink. And then I hear trying to explain to them what a hyperlink is. Um, and so, you know, that it was, there are some people that just don't know how to use Zoom. That has changed a lot, but in the beginning, that was pretty challenging. The big law firms, of course, have IT people and, if something happens, the IT person comes and helps them figure it out. Whereas the solo practitioners and um, had a lot more challenging time. The question from Rob comes though, did I hold trial uh, by Zoom? And the answer is yes, I did. I did, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, we did not do jury trials by Zoom, um, but we did do judge trials by Zoom. And the one that I can remember uh, for the most part that I did because I think it was the first one was, and it worked out really well because the plaintiffs were from out of town. So they were thrilled that they didn't have to fly into New Orleans and pay for a hotel. And you know, we may think about doing that um, a little bit more than we have. Although, as I mentioned earlier, I don't really like it, but it was a, a, some people who were in town for a wedding and got in a car accident when they were here and filed a lawsuit against the other driver. Um, so the um, plaintiff's lawyer and the other driver's attorney, who was, of course, for an insurance company, did it by Zoom. The only problem that we had um, was that they, um, and I don't remember which attorney it was, but didn't know how to use the screen sharing. So it's very hard to introduce documents into the record or ask a witness, can you look at this document if it doesn't come up on the screen on screen sharing? Um, so I guess my, the, the most advice I could, or the best advice I could give people is you either need to practice over and over and over again, or you need to have somebody who knows what they're doing with you uh, while you're doing that. Um, I have tried, unless the attorneys are from out of town, to stop doing things by Zoom because we can, it's so much more efficient to have people in my courtroom. Um, and often I find that lawyers have not met one another, don't know each other, they're on opposite sides of the cases, and it provides them an opportunity to talk about their case and, and either shorten what they have to do or actually re reach a resolution of, of their case or the matter that they're trying to, to handle. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, thank you. Um, so if there aren't, I, I just, I, I want to, the, the final question is more of just kind of you know, what else do you think you would like to share? Um, and let's see if there's one more that popped up. 
Um, well, I see Lynn's asking a question, but I'm not sure what she's asking about. So maybe she could be a little more specific. And yes, IT is our, our, let me, she's asked, Lynn has asked about IT at our courthouse, but really our courthouse is so antiquated. Um, and as I mentioned in the beginning, I've been on the bench, April was 33 years. We needed a new courthouse 33 years ago. Um, and because the building is so old and we have, it's not really funny, but rats eat the wiring. Um, often th things don't work. Um, we have had situations where the electricity doesn't work, the air condition doesn't work, um, which is challenging, but I'm not sure of the specifics of, of, the I of what she's asking about the IT. I don't remember a trial where that was an issue. I do, um, I, even before we knew about Zoom, lawyers <laughs> like to use IT um, or technology in their trials because they, particularly when it's a jury trial, they'll put up a, a, some kind of screen or to show the accident scene or the list of the medical um, that they're asking for um, or of some sort of um, quote out of a scientific journal that they think is important for the jury to, to use. But if they don't know how to make it work, it just doesn't, it doesn't go over very well. Um, and uh, you know, I say that over and over again, you've got to make sure whatever technology you're using that you know how to, uh, how to do it. There are a couple of lawyers that practice in front of me and I don't know how they do it. They practice from an iPad. It's amazing to me because I don't know that I could do that, but they can, they could have all their questions. They have all their exhibits. Um, they do an excellent job. And then there's some lawyers that are um, a little bit clueless about this. I would wanna say that yesterday we talked, we had our court meeting. We usually have them the first Tuesday of the month. And we were told that the Supreme Court is moving towards paperless, filings and paperless trials. And that instead of me signing papers, well, there will be electronic signatures and I will be signing things with an iPad and rather than my signature, which gives me great concern about hacking and, um, and those kind of things, but we'll see, it should be interesting. Um, I'm not sure it's something I wanna learn how to do, so we'll see. <laughs> the case that I was, thinking about judge, we were in trial before you and one of the lawyers had planned to live stream the testimony of an expert witness. Yeah, and uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Bandwidth at the courthouse could not support the, ban the transmission. The bandwidth, yeah, we didn't have the bandwidth to be able to do that. Yes, I do remember now that you say that. And that's the problem. I mean, I actually um, suggest to lawyers that often on Friday afternoons, our courthouse is pretty quiet, that you should come try out your technology to make sure it works. Um, the other thing is because I work there and I practiced there for 10 years, almost exclusively in the court where I'm a judge, and now I've been there for more than 30 years, I feel very comfortable there. And it's very easy to forget that, that, the, that the litigants do not feel comfortable there. They're scared. They may be coming for a divorce. They may be coming because someone has, um, they've been injured in an automobile accident or they, we get, we in our court do also do a lot of, and Lynn does some of this kind of work, what we call toxic tort cases, but in general, they're asbestos cases. Um, someone, a lot of people who've worked up and down the river have been exposed to asbestos in the shipbuilding industry. Um, people come because they, they may be a doctor who's testified often, but now he's been accused of, or she has been accused of committing medical malpractice. So they're really, really nervous. Um, and we need to make sure that they feel comfortable in our court. So I suggest to lawyers, bring them in, uh, call my staff, find out when my courtroom is not busy, um, let them sit on the witness stand, practice your questions with them. That'll help them feel a lot more comfortable. Um, but IT is a, it, it's a problem and you don't wanna have your main, most exciting witness that you think you're gonna be able to live stream and the, the court's bandwidth doesn't support it. Um, and that's a problem. 
Um, I see in the chat that someone's asked what my plans are for stepping down from the bench. And that's another good question that may be the other reason that I ran for office is I don't know what I'm gonna do with myself. Um, I, you know, I don't play golf and I don't know how to play bridge or mahjong. Um, and, but my friends who have retired are telling me that they're so busy, they don't really know how they had time to work. So um, I do know that I would wanna spend more time with my grandchildren. Um, because they are 12 and 14, which means that, you know, in four years and six years, they'll be off to college. And um, I would like to spend more time with them. I probably would like to do some more, don't laugh, Sarah. I probably would like to do some more volunteer work. Um, I really am impressed with the World War II Museum in New Orleans. So, I, and my father was a World War II vet. So I would really like to um, probably volunteer there. And I'm sure I'll find some other things to keep myself busy, but I don't have any specific plans. Um, do I want to practice law? No, absolutely not. I don't, that, that I don't want to do. Also, um, there are two other opportunities that I've thought about and I haven't completely rejected them yet, but I, I'm more on the, I don't think I want to do that side. Um, the Supreme Court appoints retired judges to hear cases that the judges of the court can't hear. So, for example, if a judge on my court um, was sued for some reason, um, none of us would want to hear that. None of us would want to hear that case. So uh, the Supreme Court will appoint a judge. Or, for example, if a judge gets elected to the Court of Appeal, it makes an open seat. They will appoint someone to sit in that seat till the next election is called. I don't think I want to do that. And part of that is once I get my self set of what I want to do with my granddaughters and volunteer work, I don't think I want to stop doing that for a short period of time and then go back to trying to do it. The other thing, and I would have more control of my schedule doing this, a lot of retired judges do mediations, um, which is a practice that that lawyers and retired judges get trained to do where they help, they help people settle their cases. We have, and this goes back to something that we talked about earlier that I, I mentioned that we hadn't done juries for a year, which makes my docket not as current. The other thing that's gonna strongly impact my docket is Hurricane Ida cases. And um, we expect to have a lot of those. We had a lot after Katrina um, at yesterday's court meeting, we um, passed a kind of a, a motion that allows for a rocket docket and mandatory mediation for Hurricane Ida claims so that, um, that people will not be denied their time in court because of time delays. Um, and I, I think that's really important that, we're gonna, that we've done that. Well, Judge, I have one more question sure. and it may be premature. What, if anything, should we expect uh, in terms of changed procedures due to this new variant of COVID? Uh, you know, I think it, we at the court still have a mass mandate. We, you know, and it's, I, I'm, I am the mass police. Uh, I walk down the hall and see, you know, they, they have to have the mass to come in. But as soon as somebody's not watching them, people take their masks off, which drives me totally crazy. Um, uh, I think you will see that mask mandate in place. I think we don't know enough yet to decide what else we're gonna do. Our court did do some things um, when, when original COVID came along. Most of us now have our entrances to our office our judicial administrator made a very good recommendation that we actually cut our doors in half so we can lock the bottom part and the top part is open so we can communicate with people, but they're not coming physically into our office, at least as much. Um, we're, my law clerk is doing many more of the status conferences where he sets trial dates um, for me by Zoom. And I do think you'll see some, some more use of Zoom at least for those kind of things. And it, one of the things that I think is challenging for lawyers is each of us is doing things a little bit differently. We have started having to write on our pleadings when we set a date for someone to come in, in person. And we never had to do that before. If we told you to show up on February 15th, you knew you had to be there in person. But in the beginning, when we switched over from doing everything by Zoom to kind of a hybrid model, 
and I wanted people there in person, people would call and say, well, where's the Zoom link? I didn't get it. Well, that's because you're supposed to be here in person. Um, so that's that's been another challenge. I, I think we're just gonna have to um, take things day by day. We have talked about whether or not we would have, you can't come into the courthouse unless you're vaccinated, but we've decided that that is something that we can't do, although we've done it for our employees. And Lynn, as you may know, I lost my minute clerk because she did not, we, we gave them a choice of either weekly testing or um, getting vaccinated and getting proof of it. And my, I had a minute clerk who didn't wanna do either, so she quit. But we've decided that we really can't do that with the users of our court. We don't feel comfortable doing that. And obviously, if you subpoenaed a witness, one way of not coming to court would be to say, well, I'm sorry, I'm not vaccinated, so I can't come. And we just don't feel comfortable doing that. So we have left the mask mandate in place um, and don't come in front of me in that courthouse without your mask on. <laughs> <laughs> Good to and know. I, think, I mean, masks work, they help. I haven't had a cold in more than two years. And I think that's part of the reason why. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks, well, Judge. Yeah, thank you. I know we have about two more minutes left. So I just wanted to um, thank you so much for your time, Judge Russo. And is there any just parting thoughts, um, things that you wanted to leave us mm -hmm. with? You know, you know, I often get asked about what are the most interesting cases you've ever tried, because some of them do get to be somewhat routine. Um, there are two that really come to mind because you sometimes forget the impact that you have on people. One of them was the, what we call the fireman's pension case when one of our mayors just decided, even though he was mandated to do it, not to contribute to the fireman's pension fund. I was most unhappy to get that case because it was very political, but of course you take what comes to you um, randomly. Um, what, and I ended up ruling in the fireman, the, all of the firemen's favor that the, that the mayor and the council had to fund that. But I got stopped on the street a lot by people who would say, my uncle was a fire, my grandfather is a fire, you know, um, there weren't too many women firemen, so that's the reason I'm not using any women's names, but um, I think it really reminded me of the profound impact that we as judges have on people's lives. Um, and I think that was very important. And I, uh, that probably is the most significant case that I've had. Mm, thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. And um, this has been so interesting and insightful. And um, I can't wait to hear about your um, retirement plans when you're ready. <laughs> when I can hear them out. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> All so right, thanks everyone. Thank you so much. Yes, have a great day. You Bye. too. Bye -bye.